Welcome to the Science Podcast for February 16, 2018. I'm Sarah Kresge. In this week's show, David Grimm talks about genes that turn on after death and what we can learn from their activity. And David Johns talks about the so-called sugar conspiracy and how it doesn't quite hold up to a close examination of the history of nutrition policy in the U.S. Now we have David Grimm, editor for our daily news site. He's here to talk about what happens to us after we die. Welcome, Dave. Hey, sir. Okay, so finally we know what happens after we die. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know what happens to our genes. Right? right, okay. So this is about what genes do when we're no longer alive. The researchers in this case were looking at gene regulation in different tissues, living tissue, dead tissue, preserved tissue. Why were they doing that in the first place? Well, you know, they're part of this uh, study. This called it's, it's called a genotype tissue expression pilot, which is a large consortium of geneticists and molecular biologists. They've been measuring gene activity in tissues from hundreds of people, and the goal of this project is to determine how the body makes different cells do different things. So it really has had nothing to do with death, but as part of the project, tissues are preserved, and the researchers know how long those tissues, you know, when the person who donated those tissues died, between when they died and when the tissues actually went. In into formaldehyde. So they have these windows of time where they can say, hmm, I wonder what's happening to some of these genes after a person dies and what can this actually tell us? And this isn't the first time anyone's discovered, you know, checked out whether or not genes are still doing something after death. There was an earlier study that showed that this went on for a surprisingly long amount of time, right? Right. You know, this was a study that we talked about uh, last year. It wasn't done in humans. It was done in deceased mice and zebrafish. But the researchers, it was kind of this creepy study, the researchers found that even four days after death, some genes remained active, in some cases, even ramping up genes potentially involved in things like cancer promotion and development, which was kind of creepy. But this new study is all dealing with human genes, human tissues. What patterns did they pick out here when it came to undead genes in people? Well, they found it was really organ specific. So for example, there was very little change in gene activity over time in the brain or the spleen, or at least tissues that came from there. But more than 600 muscle genes either quickly increased or decreased their activity after somebody died, which is really interesting. The researchers also discovered that, for example, in blood, decreased activity in genes involved in DNA production and the immune response, but an increase in those genes involved with stress response signaled that a person had died about six hours before preservation. And that brings in this time element. So you can look across tissues or across different genes and then be able to point backwards at when the death happened? Well, that's the idea. So this is still a very preliminary study. Right now, they're trying to get a sense of, okay, what genes are turning on, which genes are turning off? What does that tell us about the timing? And then the idea is to put that all together and say, you know, can we come up with a computer program where we could just sort of feed tissues into it and it could tell us precisely when somebody died? What about how they died? Well, that's the other idea because what the researchers found also is that the changes in gene expression may actually carry a signature of the cause of death. So you can imagine a future detective not having to do as much guesswork and actually just being able to sort of feed some of the stuff into a computer and figure out not only when somebody died, but maybe what killed them in the first place. Wow. One thing I wanted to ask before we wrap up, Dave, is what are these genes doing? What possible reason could there be for a gene to turn on and become active after death? Well, you know, at least in the previous study, when we had this thing where developmental genes were turning on during death, the idea was, well, perhaps the conditions are similar in a dying body to those in an embryo. But we don't really know why all these genes are turning on and off. But the question is, can we actually harvest usable information from it? All right. Okay. What else is on the site this week, Dave? Well, Sarah, we've got a couple cool videos for you, which I'm sure you know all about. One about robots modeled on cockroaches that crash into walls. Why are they crashing into the walls? You'll have to read the story to find out. Also, a story and video about ants healing each other from injuries on the battlefield and why they do that. For Science Insider, our policy blog, we've got a very in-depth analysis of U.S. President Trump's proposed 2019 budget, what the impact on various science agencies would be. Also a story about whether peer reviews 
from journal articles should be published alongside with the journal article as well. And finally, Sarah, both you and I will be at the annual AAAS meeting yeah. uh, this coming week in Austin, Texas. And uh, we'll be hopefully doing a lot of cool stories uh, from the meeting and talking about those on the podcast as well. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, sir. And you can check out the latest news in the policy blog, Science Insider, at news.sciencemag.org. Be sure to stay tuned for an interview with David Johns about the so-called sugar conspiracy, the idea that information information about sugar's harms were covered up by the industry. This Week in Science, David Johns and Gerald Oppenheimer write about this conspiracy to create a sugar conspiracy, or at least to paint a change in dietary advice from the 50s, 60s, and 70s from non-fat to low sugar as a conspiracy perpetuated by the sugar industry. Okay, David, what drew your attention to this topic? How did you get involved in writing about the sugar conspiracy? So I had been conducting research in Harvard's medical archives in the papers of Mark Hegstead for a completely different different reason. And it spent something like a month sifting through this gentleman's papers when this story about the sugar industry having influenced Mark Hegstead in particular got a lot of me- media attention. And I just felt that The way that he was being represented in in some of these stories did not reflect the person whose papers I had been reading, who seemed to be a serious scientist, who certainly did work with industry, but who believed that dietary fat was harmful, you know, before he was purportedly contracted by the sugar industry. He was known as an unusually scrupulous scientist, as a really data-driven person who was actually sort of weirdly honest in a way. Okay, well, let's talk about what was going on in the media. Like, what were people saying? What are they, what is this sugar conspiracy that we talk about in the title of the piece? So the idea basically was that somehow the sugar industry had, quote, shifted the blame to fat. So the sugar industry, by paying certain researchers, including this guy, Mark Hegstead, had sort of pushed dietary research and policy in a new direction that would sort of downplay the focus on sugar and increase the focus on fat or allow the fat theory to rise. And when you say the fat theory, the sugar theory, you're talking about whether or not it's linked with heart disease, mortality, and stuff like that. That's right. With heart disease in in particular at that time was the major focus. So the idea being that cheeseburgers might give you a heart attack. I mean, that was sort of a, a very kind of simplistic way of putting one of the ways of thinking that people had about dietary fat, specifically saturated fat, and that these fats would uh, cause the coronary arteries to become blocked up and that you might have a heart attack or have heart problems. So as a consequence of a lot of this research and, uh, you know, this opinion that was being released back in the 50s and 60s, we ended up with the no fat, low fat diet fat in the 80s and 90s. That's right. I mean, it's sort of generally referred to as a low fat diet. I mean, the truth is that the recommendations that came out had a broad range of things that they recommended. They did recommend big reductions in in sugar intake. They recommended consuming more fruits and vegetables. They recommended consuming more whole grains and complex carbohydrates. Some of the things we actually think are still good ideas now. But there was a big emphasis on dietary fat. And it was something that people talked about a lot. And it was something that some very prominent nutrition researchers really emphasized and they thought was really the most important thing that that needed to happen for public health. Going back to the history part of it, what, you know, you actually say, no, this didn't happen or this didn't happen like this or this was normal for the time. Can you talk a little bit about some of the history that people are pointing at and saying that's when the conspiracy happened, that's who was involved and, and what your understanding of what actually happened is? So there were people in the 1960s, we focus on a British researcher named John Yudkin, who was interested in the idea that sugar might contribute to heart disease. There was a whole nother group who felt that, as we've discussed, dietary fat was more likely the culprit in in heart disease. And there was a sort of a disagreement a bit between these groups. Now, disagreements in science are common and disagreements sometimes took a heated form. But the general claim has been that somehow the sugar hypothesis was not given appropriate attention, right. was not considered in, in a serious way because the sugar industry intervened and that this somehow shaped the course of dietary policy. It shifted the blame to dietary fat, that, you know, th- that this was a, a pivot point in history and things could have gone one direction or they could have gone another direction, but they went in the direction of fat in part because of the interventions of the sugar industry. 
And your research shows that that's probably not what happened. Yeah, our research shows that the researcher who, Mark Hegstead, who was stood sort of accused of having been sort of an co-opted by the sugar industry, actually believed the things that he, 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 the sugar industry paid him in effect to amplify beliefs he already had. So our research kind of puts the agency back in the hand of scientists in a way and suggests that the, the claims that the industry was really behind the course of dietary science and policy may be overstated. Right. Okay. So we kind of have these two teams, Team Sugar, Team <laughs> Fat. And, you know, over time, the industries were involved in research on both sides. Researchers were involved in, you know, all kinds of science here. And now today, you know, people have backed off the low fat diet. Sugar and high carbohydrates are considered somewhat dangerous. But do we know right now the linkages? Are we sure today about the relationship between fat, sugar, carbohydrates and heart disease? So I'm a historian. I'm not a scientist. But, <laughs> but you know, there are plenty of people who will, who will tell you what the science says. There's no question there's been a, a shift in emphasis from dietary fat to sugar and carbohydrates in general, I would say. But I think there's still a view that saturated fat is harmful. And there is still a question of whether sugar per se, has special harms associated with it apart from its caloric content. In other words, that there's something specifically toxic or poisonous or deleterious about sugar per se that goes beyond its caloric contribution to the diet. I kind of want to circle back to what we talked about at the beginning. There's been this talk in the media about a conspiracy relating to big sugar. What do you think is the biggest problem with placing a conspiracy narrative on something that happened that looks like it was more just a natural product of science over time changing what was considered important or changing the way analysis was done. I think you put you put your finger on a, a big piece of it right there, which is that, you know, science is not a train running down the track where it goes in one direction. Science, you know, has many twists and turns, and sometimes it takes, uh, moves into a cul-de-sac or takes the wrong path, and sometimes it, you know, reverses course. So there's many twists and turns, and so to interpret the twists and turns as the product of kind of dark forces or, you know, industry interventions in the absence of very strong evidence. You know, there's no question that industries have tried to man manipulate science and have you know, often succeeded or sometimes succeeded in the case of tobacco and, and, and lead. But we, we think that to look back at the history of science and without strong evidence and say that there was an industry intervention that caused it to, to do one thing versus the other is dangerous to our understanding of how science actually works. Right. Okay, David, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you so much, Sarah. David Johns and Gerald Oppenheimer write about the sugar conspiracy this week in science. You can find a link to their article at sciencemag.org slash podcasts. And that concludes this edition of the Science Podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, write to us at sciencepodcast at aaas.org. You can subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, and many other places, or listen to us on the science site at sciencemag.org slash podcasts, where you can also find links to the articles discussed in the episode. This show was produced by Sarah Crespi and edited by Podigy. Jeffrey Cook composed the music. On behalf of Science Magazine and its publisher, AAAS, Thanks for joining us.